There we go. All right. Hey there, folks. Since book tour and conventions are still on hold, I figured I would bring book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster Season 3, Intriguing Interviews with Creative Minds. I'm really excited to, about tonight's uh, segment because it is a mix, uh, a mix of uh, and a cross blending of multiple genres that I love, including a action, intrigue and pulse pounding excitement, spies, espionage and political thrillers. First up on our all star panel is my pal David Mack, the award winning and New York Times bestselling author of 36 novels of science fiction, fantasy and adventure, including the Star Trek Destinies and Cold Equations trilogies, his dark arts trilogy, and his novel for the Jack Bauer thriller series, 24. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Russ. Glad to be here. All right. Good to see you. Also on our panel is my pal, Jamie McCrone, author of the political Imogene Traeger political thrillers, Faithless Elector, Dark Network, and Emergency Powers. Jamie is a member of the Mystery Writers of America, the International Thriller Writers, Philadelphia Dramatists Center, and the Sisters in Crime Network. Welcome, Jamie. All right, thank you very much. All right, and last but not least is my pal, RJ Hunnicky, author of the sci-fi spy thriller, Cyberware. RJ currently writes regular columns about technology, robotics, books, comics, and popular culture for Gadismo, Pal Kabam, and is editor in chief and founder of Forgotten Fiction. Welcome, RJ. Oh, thanks so much, Russ. All right, so just real quick before we get started, uh, heads up to the folks at home. Uh, feel free to send me notes or questions you have for me or the panel in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. Okay, so let's jump in here. So there are overlapping themes and elements in stories involving spies, espionage, and political thrillers. And although there's a lot of nuances as well that makes them distinct, but on a broader level, what do you find most compelling about fiction, novels, movies, TV shows that involve individuals or organizations with plots that tend to have a far reaching implication? Uh, let's start with Dave. I think what makes them compelling for me and for many readers is the sense of stakes. We're talking about people who are involved in international affairs as well as having personal stakes. And the cost of failure, if they screw up, if they don't come through, uh, is often gonna be measured in the terms of millions of lives or destroyed countries. It's very easy to get swept up in the scope of something like that. Right on. Uh, how about you, uh, Jamie? <clears throat> I, I would echo uh, what David just said. And I would add, um, at least in the stories that, I, um, that I've been writing and the ones that sort of that really uh, grab me are um, the high stakes, but also sort of ordinary people, um, you know, confronted with something, you know, bigger than themselves and, you know, having to, you know, kick in, have to ante in and um, uh, fight the good fight, if you will. How about you, RJ? Do you, you, you take more of a, um, you know, you have more of a cyber um, take on these things? Well, it's... Uh... You know what's interesting in the in the cyberverse, if you will, is that some t entire towns have been held ransom uh, more and more uh, frequently of late. So uh, those high stakes are very real in the real world, and uh, and that kind of fiction is uh, you know it's it's extremely intriguing and suspenseful, especially when uh, you know it comes down to a you know a human being that's. Uh, you know, uh, uh, can possibly, make, you know, make the difference in, uh, you know, getting out of that situation. All right. So when I think of political thrillers, my mind sort of just instinctively goes to movies like Three Days of the Condor, The Parallax View, The China Syndrome, All the President's Men, The Manchurian Candidate. But most of those are from the, from the 70s. Are we still making great political thrillers today? Dave. I think so. I mean, I guess it depends on the yardstick you want to use to measure what makes something great. I think the Bourne films were interesting in that what they were examining was the notion of off the books uh, espionage and the notion of using people as weapons and treating them as disposable. You know, the idea of human resources taken to its ultimate limit. But I think in, say, you know, the 90s and the aughts, we saw films like Enemy of the State. Uh, where, you know, you, yep. yeah, so you sort of, you know, we've had movies that have addressed things like the rise of the surveillance state, 
Um, and I think that uh, you've also seen some other more serious films about the, the struggle between nations, asymmetrical warfare. You saw that in The Constant Gardener. You saw that in Syriana, uh, which starred George Clooney. Uh, I think that uh, we can still make uh, great stuff. I mean, the James Bond films are fun and often over the top and cinematic, but I still think there is a market and a place for serious uh, espionage and serious uh, political thrillers. Yeah, the, the new, the yeah. new Jack Ryan uh, series on Amazon was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, oh, very well done. Yeah, I, I was absolutely blown away with the. Uh, you know, bringing in a great mix of realistic real world implications, you know, uh, it, it was, yeah. Well, and, and I think that, um, you know, in the, uh, particularly sort of the, the 60s and the 70s, um, you know, and, you know, Le Carre and, and uh, you have, um, you know, an implacable foe that uh, win, that the, that the, uh, the gains, the wins are provisional, you know, that, this enemy, you know, you might beat them today, but they're going to be back tomorrow. Um, and uh, you know that that ends adds sort of a noirish uh, aspect to um, uh, to those uh, to the films you talked about, um, or and books that you talked about. Um, and I, I I I feel like we haven't quite. Um, figured out who the implacable foe is now. Um, uh, you know, there's no, um, I mean, I think I have, but, <laughs> but I mean, as a, uh, as a, um, uh, as a genre, um, as a culture. So uh, it actually, it was just occurring to me now. Um, so I don't know if you, any of you guys saw, there was a mini series about, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so with uh, Michael Keaton called The Company, I believe. And it was, I think he was, a, he was CIA or FBI, I, can't, I think CIA, where there was, you know, the Russians were planting someone in the US government, but this took place over, over decades, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of playing the long con, right, right. against us. In a lot of the, the political and the espionage that I've seen and read, it's a lot, it seems to be a lot more visceral. You know, it's sort of, it's sort of about like the right now. From a storytelling standpoint, do you prefer the sort of, you know, the urgency of the right now, or what's your take on sort of, you know, having stories that deal with sort of, you know, that long, that long con? Dave? Hmm. Again, it depends on the kind of story you want to tell. Uh, if they're well done, either one can be very successful. Uh, I've, <laughs> you look at Homeland, for instance, uh, not one of my favorite shows, but very popular, very long running. And that was a slow burn. It was, you know, basically about things like the rise of domestic terrorism. Uh, how do people get radicalized? Uh, can you trust that your own people aren't going to turn against you? Uh, there was a lot of interesting things going on in Homeland, but it took a long uh, run to sort of dig into them and deal with them with the subtlety they deserved. Uh, but then you have, you know, movies like State of Play. Uh, and there was another one I'm trying to remember. It involved... Uh, I think Leonardo DiCaprio was in it and he was stationed somewhere in like uh, Syria or Jordan and uh, it was very much set up because you needed a compressed time frame to mm -hmm. sort of maintain the sense of tension that worked better as a movie. Mm -hmm. Jamie? Um, <clears throat> what was the question again? I'm sorry. How, I, so, so the sort of the you know a lot of political thrillers have to deal oh, yes, with the, yes. with the um, with the, the urgency of the now versus kind of like the long the long play, right? Um, I, I like you know the urgency of, of the now, but it, it's also um, you know as I've found um, it, that it takes so long to write a book that uh, you might actually have a scene uh, where something happens that then actually happens in real life, and you have to think. Do I cut that now? Is, are people going to think I'm, you know, uh, I'm sort of uh, copying this or, you know, trading on this, you know, uh, terrible thing that's happened? Um, but uh, I think it, you know, I, I, I think that um, focusing on and and zeroing in on uh, the uh, the obstacles, the the problems 
um, the strife uh, that exists now, I think is, uh, that, that's particularly appealing to me. Um, so, so Dave, you, you had mentioned, you mentioned Homeland, that was one of my questions. Mm -hmm. So in Homeland, you know, at least in the first couple of seasons with, uh, with Damian Lewis, and if you go, remember that, the, um, what was it from uh, Kevin Costner from No Way Out and right. even, even Star Trek VI, right? There's this idea of kind of this game of cat and mouse or, mm -hmm. you know, can you find the mole right. motif? Oh, you know? classic problem of every season of 24. Right. Who's the right. mole this year? Right. So what's your, what's your feeling of that? Is that sort of, um, is it just a matter of, an, of execution or is it sort of, is it sort of a trope that's just been done to death or can it work just depending on how, how you play it out? I think as a trope, it's a little played out at this point, but I think there's obviously historical precedent for it. You'd find that it happens to this day. Um, I believe there was a rather famous case of a guy who was a mole within the FBI for about 22 years right. uh, before he finally got caught and arrested. So it's not as if it's been pulled out of thin air. But I feel like it's one of those things where I've seen it done so many times in the spy and thriller genre that at this point, I'm almost like, really? That was the best you had? That's what you went for? But I mean, I think that I'm always a sucker, though, for like the, the team up against a, uh, a superior foe. Like I'm a sucker for the Mission Impossible movies yeah. mm -hmm. uh, or even a slightly more reality based uh, sort of a team thing. Uh, in books, uh, James Swallow is doing some great stuff. His, uh, his Mark Dane series, uh, books like Exile, Ghost, uh, Shadow. They follow the character of Mark Dane. He's like, you know, the man in van. Uh, his team gets betrayed. He has to go from being man in van to man in the field. And over the course of surviving the first book, he puts together a new team. Hmm. And so he's now got new ongoing adventures. And I think that's a, a formula that I really like. Um, and it doesn't, and, and again, it did have to deal with the mole, but I thought that he did it really well. I thought he found a, a very uh, fresh take on it and he made it more personal so that it wasn't just finding the mole in the organization. It was the mole who specifically sold him out. Right. Um, so I think that maybe the trick to, you know, doing a trope like the, the mole is you've got to make sure that we care. Uh, it's got to, sometimes I think personal is better. Jamie. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, that, uh, in my, in my books, um, you're not, uh, I don't use sort of, uh, long game moles. Um, what I'm interested in, <clears throat> um, and, and that I work on, uh, I actually, uh, look for a time in my latest book, uh, uh, Emergency Powers, at the bad guys, uh, their chances, right? That they see, uh, they see an opportunity um, to, you know, switch sides and, uh, you know, gain something. Uh, why do they do that? What, what brings people to do that? Um, that? That's fascinating to me. RJ? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I try to focus, uh, you know, I enjoy characters and when I write characters, I try to focus on, you know, if, if they've been fighting against the side their whole life, what could possibly get them to change their mind? So I find that a lot more intriguing than, than the mole at this point. I think the mole has been played, you know, has been played out a bit. Uh, granted, if it's done well, it's it's the gravity of that situation when you, when you realize, you know, uh, that sense of betrayal and, and everything you know right. but uh but yeah i feel that um you know when you get to know a character in and out even if they're you know let's say the bad guy and you empathize with them you sympathize with them and then what would cause them to possibly change sides you know and, and what they fought for their whole life actually you know to me that's extremely intriguing so mm -hmm. i try to uh you know focus on that and writing some of these characters and there are some there are some good i think new uh things out there that, that tend to do that. Um, so the idea you know, of changing- well, I actually, uh, to, to what RJ was saying, I mean, that uh, I think that that's actually, you know, there's a, an extraordinary tension, um, like what he was saying, that, that, can be, uh, that can be used where uh, it isn't necessarily that they've even switched sides. It's like, uh, you know, nobody, or you know, except Richard III and, you know, Iago, uh, admit to being evil, right? <laughs> Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing, you know? 
um, and that that's uh, Richard was an evil. I mean, come on. He, was... <laughs> <laughs> I, he just he, got a bad rap. He needed a better PR department. Well, yes, he did. That's in, 100%. The, in the play itself, I, I, I realized that he got a bad rap. Uh, I was mostly <laughs> yeah. looking, talking about the character rather than uh, the yeah, you got hosed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but a great that's example of like characters switching sides, uh, the movie Kingsman. Uh, is a great example. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Where, yeah, spoiler yeah. alert for those who haven't seen it. I'm sorry, I'm about to ruin yep. something yeah, close, important. Close for you. your ears there. Uh, but basically, the leader of what's supposed to be the good guy organization, our hero figures out pretty late in the game that the leader has been turned uh, mm -hmm. and is actually working for the bad guys. And, I mean, it's a great moment. And you realize, holy crap. I mean, it really does make you appreciate the danger that's represented by the villain where they can turn people just by the sheer influence of what they've got going on. So that, that's, and I want to talk a little bit more about this. So specifically, I don't know if you guys have watched The Americans. Oh, uh, I love that show. Right. Yeah. You know, one of the, at least to me, I mean, there's a lot of brilliance within the series. But on the one hand, so you've got these, you know, planted, you know, Russians, you know, who are here since they were, you know, late teens, early 20s, and they're Americans for as far as, as everyone else knows. And it's interesting, so the husband and wife have very different thoughts about this, right? I mean, the wife is always day one. She's Russian, just masquerading, doing her job. She's right. from Mother Russia. But the husband starts to sort of say, you know, you know, cheeseburgers aren't that bad. You know, cable TV is <laughs> cable TV's pretty good. You know, it's yeah. like, I could kind of get used to this. And yet, and the daughter comes into play and she's really conflicted. And it's weird that we're supposed to be theoretically rooting for, they're the stars of the show. So we're rooting in theory, rooting for them who are the bad guys, but to them, they're the good guys. But we know, because this is from history, we know they lose at least that round of it. So there's a lot of sort of, you know, where's my head supposed to be? Who, you know, that there's a lot of internal tension with not just within the show, but within us, because we're not even sure, sure who we're supposed to, like we root for Stan because he's like the, he's like the real hero, but he's played, he's the sucker through the whole thing. Right. Yeah. He, yeah, he, he does kind of wind up being the sucker. He really does. <laughs> well, it, it, and, and uh, I, you know, uh, playing, you know, with the, the form in that way. I mean, um, Dr. Strangelove does that a little bit where, um, uh, Slim Pickens uh, bomber, right? You know, he sh you do not want him to get through. It will mean the end of, you know, civilization, the end of the earth. And yet, you know, the way it's presented and the way, you know, and they've got the martial music going in the background and, you know, and they're, they're, they're going through their checklist and you're like, you know, we're, we're like uh, George C. Scott where he goes, yeah, you know, cause he's saying, you know, uh, we could bring that baby in so low. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but you know, uh, Jet exhaust, frying chickens in the barnyard, that, that, that whole line where, and the president goes, yeah, but does he have a chance? He goes, yeah, yeah, he does. <laughs> like, you know, you're, yeah, uh, you're rooting for something you shouldn't be uh, is a really, yeah. really um, strange, strange thing to, to, to do to a reader, a viewer, whatever it might be. I don't think um, that you I feel think like I, you're rooting for the wrong thing when you're watching the Americans. You're supposed to empathize with them on a human level, not right. a political level. Right. And and their struggle is really about, you know, a husband and wife are at core in disagreement over how they want to raise their daughter, whether they want to right. raise the daughter into right. their profession or they want to let her go her own way. And that's really the core of most mm -hmm. of their conflicts. You know, I have to tell you, one of my favorite scenes of any of any show I've ever seen was I, it was late in the series. I remember whatever, maybe it was the final season, whatever, and was it Paige, the daughter, and um, she's starting to get a little bit of training now and she thinks she can do it. And when it can't, comes to just the physicality of it, you know, the husband, I mean, he's just, I mean, he's a badass. He doesn't, he's not aggressive, but you don't wanna be in a, you don't wanna be dealing with this guy if you don't have to be. And she thinks that she knows enough martial arts or wrestling moves to get out of it. And he fucks her up pretty fast. This is his own daughter. And he slams her up against the wall. And she, if, if he was her attacker, she'd be dead. And he made that point very clear. And he wasn't doing it to harm her. He wanted her to realize that this is not a game. You know, this is not a student protest. If you're going to do this, this is no fucking joke. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of that, that inner 
internal um that struggle that that moment really i mean god that that hit me where i live man that was something so all right so political thrillers getting back ultimately i think have to do with the usurping of power on a grand scale and one could argue i think quite strongly that we are living in a political thriller right now <laughs> Not the least of which was the, the recent violent attacks on the Capitol. I mean, that wasn't, I mean, that was, this was real violence, real people going up to the government and saying, we're taking over. Does the current political climate impact the way you think about your own fiction? A hundred percent. I mean, it, it, it largely spawned my, uh, my cyber war series. Um, you know, the premise for the first book in the series is that uh, hackers have gotten tired of, how the governments are governing them and they've taken over the governments. Um, so it becomes a world kind of cut up into uh, sections of, uh, of uh, hacker coalitions. And, um, you know, that's uh, on the, on the tours, you know, we came out in 20, 2015. So on the tours for a couple of years, I would constantly tell everyone, you know, this, this could be taking place six months from now, six years from now, or 60 years from now. That's kind of how I did it. I wanted it to be hard science fiction. I based it on a lot of theoretical um, science and things that are out there. Uh, but um, I didn't anticipate that, you know, within six years, we, we would actually be uh, uh, at a point where things like this are, are you know, happening. Uh, the Capitol is one example. Um, an article from EFF.org, the Electronic Foundation yesterday said that um, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted unanimously in favor of requiring all special business districts to bring any new surveillance plans to the board before adopting new technologies. What that means is before they can put up any more cameras, the San Francisco board has to approve that. They came to this decision in light of last year, the police commandeered, the San Francisco police commandeered all of the camera systems during the BLM led protests. Um, a lot of problems with that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of problems with that. So uh, aside from the big brother aspect, um, you know, the, the moral implications, even the political implications, uh, when you have that kind of, uh, when we live in a kind of world with those kind of uh, powers there, um, you know, that uh, municipalities video feed could easily be hijacked by a hacker. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as as can our governments and our own government agencies were, you know, hacked by the Russians recently. So it's 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 it, exactly as you said, Russ. It's like we're living in uh, in some weird, uh, you know, science fiction tale right now. I mean, the biggest fear is that you know a foreign agent uh, would do something to us, like what Russia did to uh, Estonia a number of years back. Yes. So they essentially yes. crippled the uh, electronic infrastructure. They crippled the electrical infrastructure. Uh, they knocked out communication so suddenly you couldn't move anything you couldn't talk to anybody there were no phones there was no radio there was no internet because of that there was no atms people couldn't get cash the stores went empty the supply lines stopped you can maybe get by for a few days off the stuff you've got in your house but if the water stops flowing if the electricity goes off within about a week you've got riots and you've got a country that is returned to the stone age um, and unfortunately, because the people who've been running our government for the last 20 some odd years have been rather short sighted, they haven't actually taken the appropriate steps to defend our infrastructure, our communications infrastructure, our electrical infrastructure, our municipal infrastructure, water supply. There's all sorts of things that could knock us out tomorrow. Um, and unfortunately, the, the whole disturbance with the Capitol, I mean, if it's had any effect on my decisions about what to write is that I don't want to write anything set in terms of modern day political thriller right now, A, because I don't want to create a how-to manual for somebody else, right? Yeah. and B, because I'm not sure I can outdo reality. Reality is just <laughs> running far and away, and I'm not sure I can ever catch up at this point. No, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it, it, um, I, uh, I conceived uh, Faithless Elector, um, you know, in the 90s. Um, and it was uh, it was the 2000 election that told me that uh, you know I was really onto something, um, and uh, and I got you know, I got to work on it. Um, 
but uh, yeah, you know, my latest book has a false flag terrorist attack, you know, on home soil. Um, and it's very different from what actually happened on January 6th, but yeah, I, you know, I, I felt um, there are, there are moments where you're like, yeah, it, I don't want to write a how-to manual. <laughs> All right, so guys, let, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so most of us here are James Bond fans, the thrills, the exotic locales, the gadgets, but the, the stakes are high with a lot of action. So Dave, I know you, I know you have, and Jamie, I know you've got some tense scenes. I've re read some of them, you've really wickedly tense scenes in the books. So what's your take on when you're writing a narrative that blends conspiracy with action? Well, again, it's got to come down to why does it matter? What happens if we fail? Like one of my favorite books I ever did, it was technically uh, on its cover, it says it's Wolverine. It was a book called Road of Bones. I wrote it back in 2006. I think it came out in 2007. It was just re-released last month in an omnibus edition uh, by Titan uh, as part of a big omnibus called Weapon X. But the premise behind it is it's basically a James Bond novel. Uh, with Logan standing in for the role of Bond. And I did all the classic James Bond tropes. He's got somebody in his ear. So he's got a little bit of a man in van cue support. Uh, he's got to go to dinner at the villain's uh, grand Russian mansion outside St. Petersburg. Uh, you know, he's got, you know, fights on aircraft, fights on boats. He's fighting ninjas. He's fighting giant mech robots. Uh, you know, whatever you can think of. So I, I pulled out all the stops, but the whole thing is basically about uh, uh, the bad guys have developed in my story something called panacea, a cure supposedly for everything. What they don't tell you is it's also addictive. Once they've got you on it, they're going to keep you on it and they're going to be the only ones who have it. And it's essentially they're marketing it as a humanitarian effort. And what Logan figures out is, no, this is a world domination play yeah. and I've got to cut it off at the knees. Right. Uh, Sweet. So, Jamie, what about you? I, I seem to recall, and I don't remember which book is from, and, and you can correct me if I'm getting the details wrong. There's a scene where I think it's in DC and the characters, they're in, they're in the car parked on the street and someone, there's, someone's at gunpoint really inside the car. Am I remembering this right? Oh, oh yeah, right, uh, yes. Um, right. Trying, to, um, uh, trying to kill Imogen, yeah. So, so I guess getting back to the question, so what's your take on, so you've got the, the espionage, you know, broadly kind of theme throughout the whole novel, but you've got action sequences. What role does the, for you, like what, where's the action, what, what should it play? What, what's the payoff? Or is, it, or is it just thrills just for the sake of thrills? Well, no, I, I think ideally um, it, it, is the, it, it is part of the payoff. Um, that uh, you know, you have you know, you have uh, the forces you know coming into conflict, and this this you know explosive moment, um, this con you know uh, is that um, uh, is that moment. Um, it'll have to it'll resolve one way or the other. You know, one person will die, one person won't. You know, what or you know whatever uh, it might be, and that. Uh, you know, but that that that's sort of the nature of uh, of climax. I mean, if you um, uh, you know earlier on in a in a story, um, if you have something, uh, you know, your your show, you know, if uh, a main character is being killed, um, you know, you're showing how uh, high the stakes really are. That you know this person you've just invested quite a bit of time in is now gone. Um, I, I I think. Uh, you know, obviously, as everyone here has said, I mean, it, 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 it ultimately depends on, you know, what it was for in that very moment. But I mean, um, in sort of broad terms, I, I look at uh, the violence not as, or, you know, if it is just there, then it is gratuitous. And I think that people will feel like, well, why is this here? Why, why are we doing this? Well, um, I think the key that, to, to that is that action should reveal character. Right. How your character uses violence or mm -hmm. how they react to violence right. should reveal something about them. Right. Yep. And that the um, you know the 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 scene that Russ uh, is talking about, um, uh, Imogen is pinned down in her car, um, and uh, how does she you know 
uh, react to it and how does she you know uh, end up fighting back right does she clever her way out does she brute force her way out does she negotiate her way out right. these are all the things that reveal character in a moment right. like that right so so speaking on so while we all love a good explosion uh, some of the most <laughs> pulse pounding moments can come from the tiny moments right retrieving a piece of data uncovering another layer of conspiracy what is it about the reveal that's so important in these genres and in, in this sort of in this mixed genre RJ. Well, I, I think, um, you know, when, when something's shrouded in mystery, that, that you know, the reveal is, uh, is a big part of the payoff, you know, so the, the action, the action often kind of emanates a, a physical, you know, conflict, you know, if you, you can have a, you can have a conflict between, um, you know, a spy trying to hack his way into a, a government facility um, that's all digital, but that uh, physical blow is something that the reader feels and can relate to. So, uh, so that's where I think that that's you know that that kind of plays a part, um, and, and the reveal uh, is of the utmost importance. Um, you know, it's it's especially if you can kind of pace it in the right way, so that you have an arc that is kind of continuing to give uh, you know good, good pieces of information while maintaining the overall mystery you know so that at some point someone may get a clue in as to you know where all this foreshadowing is leading and uh, and you know and, and then ultimately see what the big picture is in the end okay. mm -hmm. well and I think that you know when you can when uh, <clears throat> you can have um, you know the reader, uh, and the, the character have the same, you know, aha moment, um, you know, uh, where, you know, the reader uh, at the same time as your character has put two and two together, um, that can be, you know, incredibly uh, valuable um, and uh, rewarding um, as a, you know, to the reader. Dave? Well, what are you talking about when you mean the reveal? Are you talking about well, like the revelation of like what the whole thing is about? Or are you well, just it doesn't about necessarily, I mean, when I say the reveal, maybe I'll, I'll rephrase. So there's sort of, you know, the big reveal can be like, oh, you're the secret villain, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of stuff comes down to, for example, this wasn't a political thriller exactly, but I'm thinking back to, um, it was the first Iron Man movie actually when uh, Pepper Potts is in now. Uh, she figures out Obadiah Stane. Obadiah, is. right? And she's put she puts in the flash drive, and you're watching. You know, you're watching the scroll by come by, and you're like, okay, twenty percent, thirty percent, forty percent, and he's coming down the hall, and you know it's sort of a race to the is she is she going to kind of get away with it? So those, you know, there's no explosions, right? There's no nothing's blowing up. There's no chase scenes. There's no cars, airplanes, rocket ships. It's these little personal moments where the stakes are so tense. You know, so for you, well, how do you, what's well, your I think what makes a moment like what you just described tense is the fact that you've got to have a power differential between the person making the discovery and whatever is coming for them. In the case of Pepper Potts, in the first Iron Man movie, she doesn't have superpower. She doesn't uh, have access to anything larger than life. She's making this shattering discovery and she realizes that knowing it, and if he finds out she knows it, he's probably going to kill her. And he's much bigger than her, much stronger than her. She has no reasonable way to call for help because she's pretty much cut off. She'll never get word out before right. he'll snap her neck. She's basically vulnerable. The way a scene like that plays is whoever is making the discovery has to be in a position where they are vulnerable, where they are not right. either unable to fight back or are completely outmatched. Right. Um, but for some reason, there's got to be the vulnerability. The person making the discovery has to be someone who is going to be at, in jeopardy just for knowing it. Um, for instance, in my book, uh, Star Trek Section 31 novel, Control, I have a character who is a, uh, a scientist, uh, a journalist, you know, a scientist and a journalist basically make a discovery about an AI that's behind everything in the Federation. It's in the root of everything it's in the internet of things it's in the comm relays and they realize they can't talk about it because the moment any word leaves their mouth they're going to be dead so they realize they have to communicate in literally handwritten notes on paper because you can't type anything right 
the moment you commit anything to a digital file, the That's system it. knows. Right. So they're working with hand messages and they're slipping handwritten notes to people at like a state dinner trying to get help. <laughs> and they know that they fuck up once. That's it. That's it. The system will kill them and it'll make it look like an accident. Right, right. So that's you've a, got to have that level of vulnerability. No, the that, person who has acquired the information has to be completely vulnerable. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great I, I love the, I love, uh, I, I haven't read that, but I love the, the idea of, you know, the Star Trek universe being reduced to, you know, and that, that's brilliant. Turns out there's a malevolent AI that's been running all of it. <laughs> uh, good stuff. All right. So uh, one or two more, and then we're going to move on. Um, so characters involved in espionage and spy and political thrillers by necessity put themselves in grave danger. But what's the balance that you're looking for when it comes to believing that these characters are competent enough to handle such overwhelming and dangerous circumstances, yet not making them so talented, essentially superheroes, that they aren't really ever in danger? Well, um, you know, my, uh, you know, my characters are ordinary people and that, uh, uh, you know, um, I have the, uh, in Faithless Elector, I have uh, the professor, <laughs> Duncan Calder, get in a fight with a, um, you know, with a trained thug. Um, he's gonna lose, but, um, you know, there was sort of one, you know, moment where um, he was able to, you um, Get something over on the guy and and actually prevail, but you know at great great cost to himself as well. Um, I think that if you uh, if you show how human they are, um, how um, and how they bleed, <laughs> uh, that uh, you can pull it off. Because yeah, you don't want to uh, you don't want sort of the mild mannered professor who of course is you know uh, a ninja you know warrior you know. You get one gimme per character. That's right. <laughs> right. Right. So RJ, on, on the same thread, since you know you deal with and and also Dave's speaking mm -hmm. of section thirty one. So you know, and we just you talked about it before, right? The guy in the van, like the hacker, has become really kind of you can't every show, every movie, everyone's got a hacker, right? Felicity Small gets to the keyboard. Oh, I can I hacked into the I hacked into the Pentagon in six in six seconds. You know, yeah. I mean, we can we can uh, assume that they are very good at what they do, but how good should they real could they or should they really be? Are we talking specifically about hackers or just yeah. our characters in general? Well, let's just shift a little bit to kind of the, the cyber element of it. Um, what what's just what's your what's your thought on this? They have to be as good as the story needs them to be to advance the plot, but not so good that they could solve it on their own. Fair enough. That's it. They have right. to be as right. they have to be as good as the plot demands them to be. Right. Right. RJ. Uh, you know, I interviewed a lot of uh, cybersecurity professionals. Um, I may or may not have spoken to some <laughs> former black hat hackers here or there. Um, I've, but you know, uh, uh, from the research that I've done and from speaking to them. You know, one of the things that brought home the kind of the gravity of uh, their skill set, if you have a, a top level hacker, is that um, no matter what the password is, uh, what the account is, they can get into it. It's just a matter of time. What does that mean? Well, depending on the amount of uh, digits, that's going to increase the, the, uh, the level that a software, you know, take, is going to take to uh, crack it decrypt that, you know, uh, code, you know, going by, going through it one, line by line. It also um, depends on the resources the hacker has access to, what kind of hardware, what kind of software, what kind of time. So it, it's, you know, hearing that was kind of, you know, it's like, it, how interested are they in you? If they if they really have it out for you, they're going to spend a lot of time, they're going to spend a lot of resources and, uh, right, you know, you. and that's, yeah, that's, um, so, and then bringing that into, into fiction, I, I, a reviewer did me one of the best favors I ever had. I would think I was maybe 20 years old and I had entered uh, the Amazon Breakthrough Award contest. And he said to me, uh, your, your characters remind me of um, 
the spy who came in from the cold by john Le Carre. Wow. Nice. and uh i hadn't read that you know i was 20 years old i hadn't read that uh, which is uh, embarrassed to say but uh, of course I, I i have since gobbled up uh you know all of his stuff and uh, but that book in particular still resonates with me and so you know my uh the sequel to cyber war the, one of the main characters uh is on the run and has to be just become a regular hitman for hire you know so i kind of combine the james bond element with the hacking element you know you're gonna have a spy that's boots on the ground you're gonna need some of that physical fun uh pow bam uh uh skill set but your your main you know uh, uh, target may be actually uh, hacking something getting into a facility that way and then overrunning it but uh i take this character and i just i just he just becomes the worst alcoholic because he has to live with himself just murdering people um to survive at this point to kind of try to fulfill his role because of the vendetta that he has so um you know really uh hackers of people you know <laughs> i mean it's it's just uh you know every story seems to need to have one now and and uh that the my favorite show movie anything that has to do with hackers by far would be mr robot was one of the most fantastic oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh pieces yeah. i think of fiction ever put on screen uh if, if you haven't seen it I, I highly recommend it and it's real mostly i'd say more than you know, I, my book is not a very technical book, and, and that show has real tech in there. Everything they're showing you is legit. It has been uh, uh, consulted on. I've spoken to people that have consulted with the show on that. Um, it's fantastic. But what's cool about it is it's really a psychological thriller at heart. Right. That's what it's really all about. Right. And, uh, and and so, uh, um, you know, had I known Mr. Robot was going to come out a year or two after my book came out, um, I probably wouldn't have written the book because like you said, hackers are everywhere now and I like to do things differently. But at that, that said, I still love my world and I think it's a little bit different, but, um, All right. but yeah, sorry to, I'm rambling a little no, bit, but it's, okay. but it's, uh, you know, okay. I, I, the, the skill set is, is there, but, but they're also human. So it's, uh, you know, as Dave said too, you know, the resources, the time they want to spend. And, and so when you have a government doing it, for instance, and if they're investing in it, you know, you could, you could, uh, you know, and, now, like and now there's quantum computing, which is going to be a total game changer. Quantum computers, in theory, will be able to uh, change the game of cryptography probably for a few years until uh, code making catches up to quantum uh, computing based code breaking. And the, and the AI may, may be doing the code making for us at that point, uh, which, yeah. is, which is also, uh, you know, it's just incredible. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Yes. Talking, so, about handing over, talking about handing over the keys. Okay. Well, <laughs> on that cheery note, that was great. But it's time for the special segment where we, as always, where we spin the wheel. On the wheel are seven possible categories I created, especially for this panel. Wherever it lands is what you get. And the categories are shaken, not stirred, damn it, Chloe, get off my plane, the president's on the line, Q tip, the spy who loved me, and secret knock. Okay. You ready? RJ, you're up first. You ready? Boy. Good. The suspense is killing me. That thing right. really goes. You get? Well, that's you what got, it's supposed to. And you and you got the spy who loved me. Okay. So nice. what do we got? So true lies, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and other such movies have married couples teaming up as spies. Assuming you were a spy couple with your significant other, do you think you die in the line of fire at the hands of your better half from all the bickering, or would you find a way to make it work? I would give it a 50-50 shot that we would make it work or I would die at the hands of my beloved. Um, she would by far be the one kicking ass and taking names and, and I would be running behind her screaming, trying to, trying to catch up uh, and keep up. Um, no question, no question. But uh, so long as I don't piss her off too much we uh, i think we could we could be successful we do make a great team and uh that's, uh, that sounds like marriage in general there you go <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't piss her off too much <laughs> you just might get through this <laughs> you you all right dave you're up next ready all no. right what do we got here okay oh a perfect one. Oh, if there was ever a perfect one for you shaking that stirred 
Sorry. If you were the next 007, what would be your signature drink? Hmm. Probably uh, Knob Creek Old Fashioned. Knob Creek Old Fashioned. All right. Right on. All Tasty. Right. Tasty. See? You see, you do a little spy. You, you know, you blow up a few, uh, a few, up a few countries and then uh, you knock one back. All right. Here we go. Jamie. And what do we got? We got Q-tip. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So you're heading off on your next secret spy mission and Q meets to give you his latest piece of tech. If you could choose any, P any gadget you want for yourself, what would you pick? An easily concealed jetpack. I'd like, you know, like in Thunderball. I mean, that was a big one. It wasn't, you know, you, you couldn't conceal that. But, you know, the, the idea that I could fly away uh, from from danger would... I'm sorry, the correct answer is submersible Aston Martin Vanquish. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I was going for. I mean, come on. You got to go with the car. Is that, that was... <laughs> Uh, it's just a, it's just a cool car, man. I'm sorry, but I want that ornithopter, you know, helicopter thing that uh, Sean oh, yeah. Connery flew away in. You know, that's uh, that was pretty uh, good. Yeah, all right, <laughs> but a jetpack is all right. All right, just a quick interlude for the folks who came in a little bit late. If you have any comments or questions for me or the panel, I'll put them in the chat box and we'll get to them in a couple of minutes. All right. So what I've done is I decided to mix things up a bit this season. So we're all going to be taking turns in the writer's chair. There are three options, which include advice column, revision decision, and the two-fisted love monkey. Okay. I don't I like have, the sound of that. Yeah. Okay. I have here in my hand, I have three index cards, which I've randomly marked A, B, and C. So in the spirit of tonight's theme, pick your poison. All right, Jamie, you're up first. A, B, or C? A. A. A is revision decision. Okay, so when writing a manuscript, whether it's a short story, no novel, novella, play, what have you, it will always require revisions. When you really need to dig in and clean up what you've got, what's your approach to editing your work? Um, I, you know, I go back through it to, you know, and it, uh, make sure that, you know, uh, every scene actually needs to be there. Does it actually advance the plot? Does it reveal something about character? Uh, is it, um, you know, is it worthwhile? Uh, is it, is it um, you know, increasing tension? Um, it, you know, if the answer to any of those is no, uh, either it needs to be rewritten or it needs to be cut. Do you rely on, you know, do you have outside readers who come in that you give it to or do you just do it on your own? Well, so I go through multiple revisions, uh, and so I will um, I will get it into a, uh, a state that I think is uh, you know uh, shareable, um, and then um, I have a, a number of friends that uh, I would ask to look at it um, and you know talk to me about. Uh, I, I don't ask for like really really close reading, but uh, you know certainly some of the big things. Um, my, my wife is my, uh, my first reader and uh, my uh, greatest critic. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Okay, Dave, you're up next. You got B or C? I'll take C. C, and you are the two-fisted love monkey. Damn it. <laughs> okay. As writers, when we put our work and ourselves out there, criticism of all kinds comes with it. Criticism being the two-fisted love monkey, the good and the bad. How do you feel about reviews? Do you take them to heart? Do you let them roll off you? Do some stick with you more than others? I think in terms of reviews, if you're talking about the ones on Amazon, I ignore them. I, I like to see the number of them increase, but I don't actually bother to read them. A professional review or semi-professional review, I might take interest in. I'll be more interested in ones that are from literary blogs uh, or well-known, well-trafficked blogs such as Tor.com, uh, Sci-Fi.com, something like that, especially if it's one that's related to the genre in which I'm working. Then I might take the review a little more to heart, especially the negative reviews. They always cut right to the bone because yeah. uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, you put work out there and it's like putting a little bit of yourself out there, but once it's out, well, there's nothing more you can do about it. It's out there, you know, call the cops. It's already out there. Ooh, it's out there. So it, it does wound a little bit. I do try to at least take some, uh, you know, education from it as I say, all right, you know what, maybe they're right. Maybe I could have done that better. Maybe that was a mistake. Uh, especially if I find across several reviews by several different parties on different sites, if they keep coming back to the same point, well, then clearly I missed something. Um, the good reviews are always pleasing, you know, nice to get a little bit of ego boost, but it's also important that we not believe our own press uh, because that way lies complacency and if you're not always pushing yourself to say, what can I do better this time than last time? How do I make the next book not only live up to what I've done before, but how can I do something that's better than what I did before? If you're not always asking yourself that question, I think maybe you're doing something wrong. Fair enough. All right. So RJ, you're the last up. So you, you're, you are going to get the, the advice column. So throughout your career, um, I'm sure you've gotten, as writers, we're all um, we all get, we've all gotten advice about writing. What's the best and worst advice that you ever got? Uh, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I think the, the best advice I ever received was, uh, was, was in Stephen King's book on writing, um, where he said to write every day and to read every day. And then as you go through it, you realize that, you know, he's investing at least a few thousand words every day. Um, in a recent uh, interview I saw with him, I think he said he's only doing a thousand words a day. He scaled it back a little bit, you know, but uh, still a significant thing. And that's that's something that I've stuck to. You know, if you look at it as, uh, as, as a job, as it is, and you read, write, and edit every day, um, you can continue to stay sharp, you know, and, and to, to continue to work on it because there's always room for improvement. Um, though some of the worst, uh, worst advice I've gotten. Um, uh, I, I, I'd say there are, uh, let's see. Neil Gaiman has 10 rules of writing, which are fantastic. And, uh, and they speak to, listen to someone when they when they say they can't quite understand this chapter or or you know that this just isn't working for them you're not getting across to the reader then which which is 100 percent right uh but don't necessarily listen to someone that gives you very specific advice on how much better um your cue for instance you know that jetpack shouldn't be concealed that thing should be out there that should have wings and you should be able to, uh, uh, you know, parade over the city. And the exhaust uh, thruster should extend from his buttocks. A hundred percent. A hundred percent, you know, so I've, I've gotten some very specific advice that, that just totally threw me out of, uh, you know, I got some, some great criticism and, and advice, and then I got something so specific that I was just like, oh, wow, I, I don't even, I don't even know what to, uh, I, I've totally lost here. <laughs> All right, fair enough, guys. All right, so we got a couple of minutes. So we're going to take some questions from the audience here. So when you guys, so this one is for everyone. So when you're all writing, do you try hard to block out any comparisons to characters that appeared in popular movies or literature, or do you embrace them but make it your own? Anyone got thoughts there? So since I'm writing tie-ins, I kind of have to evoke the characters. Yeah. Yeah. I have to go the opposite direction. I have to capture the characters, not uh, not not avoid them. Right. Yeah. No, I don't. Um, I don't consciously um, either way. I mean, I you know I'm looking for uh, a very specific character. Um, you know, somebody I can see and uh, who whose voice I hear, um, and I hope that it will be actually unique. Okay, so uh, one, one more. Uh, when you start a new book, um, do you sometimes use news, news stories of actual spy situations as your, rust, as your rough draft? I don't. Um, I, I, I sort of look at a, a situation that uh, I think is, you know, ripe for, um, uh, you know, 
some kind of nefarious plot and, and go for it. Um, what, what the interesting thing is that sometimes what I'm writing um, actually ends up, uh, you know, being, being copied <laughs> uh, in real life. All right, so I had one more question I wanted to just touch on real quick. I was thinking recently about the movie 12 Monkeys uh, with Bruce Willis. And at the end of the movie, he actually completes his mission, but that doesn't mean that he prevented this horrible global catastrophe. So yeah, that wasn't that, his mission. Right, that wasn't his mission, right? He did his job, but this horrible thing still happened. So ultimately when it comes, to, comes down to these kinds of, you know, these big narratives, are you looking for the protagonist to save the day? Or is it enough that they give it their all, even if they come up a little short? Hmm. I, again, I think it depends on what the objective is. Sometimes there is no saving the day. It depends on the, right. the story. Sometimes it's, you can't save the day, you can't save everybody, but you can save this one thing, or you can save this one person, or you can save the kernel of something that can be used to rebuild later on. I think that that's just as important as preventing catastrophe as saying we can preserve hope even in the face of catastrophe. All right. All right, guys. So look, we're getting down to the end. So we're going to, this, this, this is a great hour, but now we're going to do a little shameless promotion. So you guys can tell us what you got. I'm going to share my screen here and you guys tell me uh, what we're looking at. Okay. So, so this one is, so, so Jamie, what do we got here? Uh, so this is emergency powers. Um, when the president uh, dies in office, uh, and that's not a spoiler because it happens on page one, uh, Imogen Traeger, the uh, uh, FBI agent, knows that the uh, conspiracy she's been chasing still has life in it and she needs to get back in the hunt. Um, the, uh, this is um, you know, the final uh, act, the final power grab. All right, very cool. Where can we get it? Oh, uh, everywhere. Um, bookshop, uh, you know, dot org, uh, Amazon, um, uh, you know, your local bookshop, uh, Barnes and Noble, everywhere. All right. All right, guys, pick it up. Jamie's great. All right. So next, what do we got here? We got, okay, Dave, what are we looking at? Uh, that's uh, my 24 novel uh, that won the Scribe Award. The basic story is Jack Bauer is a man without a country. He has uh, got every major country in the world hunting for him. He's got a price on his head. So because he lives in exile, he wages a one-man war against the, uh, the cruel, the corrupt, uh, and especially those who profit off the death and suffering of others. In this, he's going after an arms dealer who was established in the uh, Live Another Day miniseries. He's tracked uh, the guy's assets to a particular freighter and he gets himself aboard the freighter under an alias. This is all like right in the first chapter or so. And what happens is Somali pirates take the ship off the coast of Som uh, Somalia in the Gulf of Aden. And things quickly get out of hand as he realizes these are not your average Somali pirates. They are way too well armed, way too well equipped, and way too well informed. Somebody's behind them and they've come to this ship not for a general raiding mission. They're here to steal something specific. And he figures out what it is and that he realizes he's got to go after it and get it back. Uh, so it's basically, you know, it follows the classic 24 format. There are 24 chapters. Each represents one hour of real time. Uh, it takes place mostly in uh, Somalia uh, during, I guess, you know, the what would be current day setting. Uh, it deals with warlords, factions. Uh, there's terrorist organizations, competing uh, factions. Uh, you know, uh, SEALs, you know, SEAL team gets involved. Cool. Lots of fun. All right, cool. And we got one more from you. Control uh, <laughs> is my Section 31 novel featuring Julian Bashir. Uh, this came out in early 2017. It is the culmination of several long running uh, books of Julian Bashir going up against Section 31. And this is where he gets pulled into the grand conspiracy and he realizes that the entity known as Control, which is the commanding uh, entity behind section 31 he finds out that it's actually an all-encompassing sentient artificial intelligence that is now existing in a distributed state uh, with faster than light communication it exists pretty much in everything in the federation the federation is control control is the federation and you can't destroy one without risking destroying the other wow cool stuff man all right 
great stuff. And then RJ, whoop, hold on, sorry. What do we got? Oh, sorry, I'm a little, a little sensitive here. Oh, I'm you being just, bad. You are, are, are having I'm being a mess here. Son. There we go, come on. There we go. There's somebody Yay. messing with the uh, sequence here. There we go. Yeah, that's my book, Cyber War. Um, in a world where hackers have taken over the governments and formed their own governments, a cyber warrior named William Waltz has uh, found that one of his close uh, friends and colleagues uh, has passed away. And when he looks into the way of his death, he, he comes across some information that uh, this new formed government does not want him to, to have. Um, they turn on him and in a world where um, you know, uh, uh, DNA ID is, is uh, prevalent. It's very hard to hide. And so he has to go on the run and uh, seeks out a foreign agent uh, on cyber American soil. And, uh, and her name is Zara Finn. And she's charged with trying to get him out of the country alive if possible. Um, and it becomes a very uh, precarious uh, relationship and uh, and a fun uh, fun ride, I, I think. All right. All right, right on. And last but not least, since we've been talking about spies, espionage, and racing against the clock, I'll encourage you to check out my sci-fi mystery thriller, Crackle and Fire, featuring my hard-boiled intergalactic private eye, Angela Hardwick, who was hired to find a missing intern with stolen corporate files but soon finds herself tackling with dueling gangsters, hostile protesters, and a madman from Earth with galactic ambitions of his own. Crackle and Fire is available on Amazon and published by Crazy Eight Press. All right, this was a great hour. I wanna thank everyone who showed up today. Thank you, Dave, Jamie, and RJ for being on the panel and for everyone who's watching at home. I hope you had a great time. I'm your host, Russ Colchimiro, and I will see you guys all next week. All right, take care now.